appreciate all you guys do week in, week out. It's amazing to get up here and sing like that. It's awesome. How's everybody doing this morning? Well, I am not Pastor Scott. I am, I am one of the pastors here. My name is Mike. If it's your first time here, we're glad you're here. I uh, met a couple of you. Um, you know, just glad you came out this morning. You're in for a treat. Um, and I'm referring to the music. That, that was the treat. Um, no, I, I don't know about you guys, but I love living in South Florida. You know, I, I, yeah. Can we get a round of applause for South Florida? Yeah. You know, a lot of people complain, but I got to tell you, every 4th of July, I'm reminded that uh, we get 4th of July weather pretty much all year round, right? When you live up north, you're like, all right, you know, dust the snow off the grill. It's finally time, you know, 4th of July, <laughs> right? It's like, no, nah, it's 4th of July weather all the time. So just out of curiosity, um, how many of you like to grill? You like to cook out, right? We get to cook out all year round. Um, how many of you are charcoal people? Raise your hand kind of informal poll here. How about propane? propane? Yeah, a lot more propane people, right? Yeah, we're propane people also. But the thing is, with charcoal, you kind of know when you're out of charcoal, right? Like, if you're going to grill, you're like, we got to pick up charcoal and burgers, right? But when you got propane, kind of roll the dice, right? And if you're old enough to remember the old days, you just kind of had to, like, lift it and kind of, like, uh, might be okay, but... But if you had friends coming over, you know that's when it's going to go out. Like when you got that grill loaded and 50 people at your house, you guarantee that thing's going to go out, right? But thanks to the marvels of modern science, somebody invented a little sticker that you can put on that tank, and it tells you where that level is, right? Yeah, so it saves you a lot of, a lot of grief. And I got to tell you, I, I, I don't like returning propane tanks. I don't know what it is about it. I dread having to return that thing. I don't know what it is. It's not that big a deal, but for some reason, I'll put off grilling for like weeks just so I don't have to like exchange that tank. And even that's gotten better now. You can just like swap them out, right? Um, but the, the thing is, you know, propane tanks are not the only thing uh, with a fuel level, right? Um, they're not the only tanks that need fill. And the reality is that we... Uh, we have spiritual tanks, right? We have emotional tanks. We have energy tanks. And, uh, and we have gauges, <laughs> right? They may not be the same kind of gauge, but if we look in someone's eyes, we can kind of tell where they're at, right? I mean, if we really stop to look and kind of look in their eyes and see if there's life in their eyes or if there's just this, this deadness, right? Or just fatigue <laughs> or, you know, uh, just bags under their eyes or whatever, right? You can just kind of tell. If you look at the gauge, you're like, this person needs to be filled. Um, you can watch the way they walk, if they're shuffling or if they're, you know, standing straight up, shoulders are up, or if they're just kind of slumped over, right? And we all have these gauges, and we all have these tanks. So how's your tank looking these days? I mean, I, I hope that you have people in your life that are watching your gauge, right? And they're kind of filling you up when you need it. And I hope that you're keeping an eye out on each other uh, and not just, you know, small talking and, and taking that pat answer, but really looking and seeing, like, does this person need to be filled? Does this person need to be reminded of God's goodness, right, and, and what God can do in their life? Who needs a pick-me-up? Anybody in here need a pick-me-up this morning? Oh, good, only three of you. <laughs> good, well, then you can go out and fill other people, all right? Um, but, you know... There's people that when you're with them, they, they fill your tank. And, and there's people that are keeping an eye on you, and they know right when to give you that, that, that hope and that reminder that you can do it, right? And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning is encouragement. Because I think it's lacking. I think it's lacking in our culture. I think it's lacking in our churches. I think it's lacking in our businesses and our families. Just the encouragement. We've become such a... Uh, you know, kind of focused on ourselves and kind of what's going on in our own lives that we forget, man, if we, if we lift everybody else up around us, we rise with it, right? So that's what encouragement means. It literally means to the act of putting courage into someone. Have you ever felt somebody put courage into you? Like, like literally felt your just spirit just lifted where you were just about ready to quit. You just about had it. You'd kind of given up felt like, you know, I'm on an island, nobody cares, I'm all by myself, I'm, I'm just ready to pack it in. And then somebody inspired you to get going again. It's, it's an awesome feeling, it's an awesome 
experience. I remember uh, back in 2012, uh, my wife and I were running uh, the Miami Marathon. And for those of you that, that, that may know me, you say, oh yeah, Mike's a runner. No, I'm not a runner. My wife is a runner. I love my wife, and my wife loves running, okay? <laughs> so that's important to know in this story is like this isn't, this, she drags me on these things, all right? Um, so we're, we're down in Miami. We're running this, this marathon together. We've been training, but uh, I had had some injuries, and so we're, we're doing pretty well. I'm able to kind of keep up with her for a while, and we're about mile 23, and I'm hitting the wall. I'm like, I'm like you know, I'd done it before, and I'm like, I should be able to finish, but I know you've trained hard, babe. Like, I know you've been working hard. You can do better than this. Like, I'm ready to just quit. I know you got fuel in the tank, right? So I convinced her over the course of a few miles there. I said, just go, just go. Like, I want you to, I want you to do well. I want you to go ahead without me. Um, and she reluctantly says, okay. Right? First time we ever split up, and she, she goes off, right? And man, I am so relieved. <laughs> I am so relieved. I'm just like, oh, thank God I can walk, right? Like, I'm going to finish, but man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my time. Like, I'm just whatever, right? You know what they call you when you finish, the finisher. That's all that matters, right? So I'm not looking to get on the podium or anything. So, so I'm so excited. I'm like, thank God she's gone. I can walk. Like, I know she's, she's having a good time up there <laughs> doing her thing. And uh, so I, I'm only walking for a couple minutes. And I, all of a sudden, I hear this from the side. Pastor Mike, go, man, go. Don't give up. Don't get, I'm thinking, all right, I'm hearing voices now. This is now I'm scared because this is, this is weird. There's no, I'm in Miami. Nobody knows me as Pastor Mike down here. Uh, the only people from Morningside were in the race or waiting at the finish. Because it's mile 23. They're not there. They're at the finish. They're expecting us in a few minutes, you know. So I'm like, what in the world? And I'm looking around. I see this kid. Go, Pastor Mike, come on. And he's there with all these UM students, right? His name is Frankie Z. If you guys remember Frankie Z, um, he used to be in our youth group, and he was down there as a med student. And he and a bunch of guys were down there cheering on the, the runners. And I'm like, i like, awesome, right? Because it's fake. You see, yeah, man. I look over there. I'm like, yeah, I got this. And, man, I shot out like, I was, like a shot of adrenaline. Like I was shot out of a cannon, man. I was, I was Usain Bolt, right, for about 100 yards. <laughs> and I look over there. I'm like, you can't see me anymore. All right. <laughs> and I start walking. I'm like, oh, man. Now I don't know if I'm going to make it. But, like, that moment, like, he took my tank and he, like, just filled it with nitrous. And I just, like, boom, go, right? And it was, like, that carried for, like, probably the next mile or so. Just like, man, that was so cool. I can't believe out of 4,000 people, you know, he, he picked me out. And then I thought, man, that's really embarrassing. Out of 4,000 people, <laughs> he picked me out. But, he, you know, he just, he made a difference. And I, I still remember that to this day. And that was, you know, in 2012. And there's people like that, right, that can just, they see it like, you know, he, he could have said like, you know, come on, don't walk, you know, or whatever, like, but he didn't. He's like, you can do it, right? And he, and he put that courage into me, and it was awesome. And wouldn't it be great if everybody in our life was an encourager, right? Man, so it's so easy to point out what somebody's doing wrong, right? Well, if you, why don't you do this? Why don't you try this, right? Instead of saying, you know what, you can do this. You know, and, and, I, and I felt that with Frankie. He was like, you can do this. And he put that courage into me. Encouragement correctly understood is a major theme in the New Testament. Over a hundred times the word uh, encouragement used in the New Testament. And I love that. Uh, and, and as we get to the end of the message today, I think you'll see why it was so important um, as, we, as we talk about encouragement in the context of these, these characters. So today we want to focus on a couple guys, but mainly the, the, the patron saint of encouragement, and that was Barnabas, right? I love Laura Rells over here. She's like, she's always like, Barnabas. Like, she knows. Like, she could leave now. She, she could probably teach this. But yeah, Barnabas, right? Uh, we find him mostly in the book of Acts. Um, we're going to look at him this morning starting in uh, Acts 4, verse 36. And here's how the story begins with Barnabas. I think we have, yep, there it is. Thanks, Stan. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Um, actually, is that my verse? That looks different than mine. Right, I'm going to read mine. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who the apostles called Barnabas, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. 
So this can be a little confusing because I just told you we're going to talk about Barnabas, but then we call him Joseph. Um, Joseph was a Levite, and a Levite um, was an Israelite. And uh, specifically, they would help out um, in the temple, uh, usually as a, as a doorkeeper or maybe in the choir or a musician, uh, doing different, uh, you know, different ministries in the church. But Joseph, unfortunately, could not do that because Joseph uh, was born in Cyrene. So he was born overseas, which made him a Hellenist. And so the Israelites, the Levites uh, that were Israelites, born in Israel, uh, there was some contention between these two groups because they felt like they were Gentiles, like they had, uh, they had adopted too many Gentile customs. They didn't speak Aramaic. So there was this tension between them. They said, you know what, you can't serve with us. <laughs> kind, of a, kind of a raw deal. You know, he's like, hey, I'm a Levite. And they're like, yeah, not really, okay? Um, so Barnabas could have been really bitter about this. He could have been really resentful about it. But he's, he's an optimist. He's a, he's a, he's a really forward thinking guy. So he goes, you know what, that's all right. Uh, what can I do? So he gets involved with this early church in Acts. And uh, at the time, people are selling their property and they're kind of giving it to the, the, the church and they're kind of distributing it amongst the people in need. And he goes, you know what, I can do that. I've got some property I can sell. And so he does. He sells some property and he gives it to the apostles. And he's not the only one doing this, like I said, but he is the first one to be identified by name, which is interesting. And he's basically saying, you know, I'm giving this to you guys. With no strings attached. You don't have to build a building with my name on it. You know, you don't have to, you know, have the, the Barnabas Fund or anything like that. Like, here it is. I believe in what you're doing. I hope this helps. Give it, uh, give it to the people. And it's really, really cool when somebody gives as encouragement, right? Um, I mean, we see this happening all the time now with like GoFundMe pages and stuff like that, right? I saw a video the other day of this, uh, this couple who thought, they, maybe you saw this, uh, this couple that thought they were filming a, a GoFundMe video in this restaurant, but in fact, outside, were like thousands of people lined up with cash ready to give to them. So they think they're filming this GoFundMe video, and all of a sudden, people start walking in and putting money down. And it, the wife had cancer, and she... Uh, um, she, you know, needed money for surgery and stuff. So this line of people starts coming through, just dropping money, just dropping money, just dropping money. And it's not, I mean, it's not long at all before the husband is just, I mean, literally soaked in tears. He's just, he's crying for like 30, 45 minutes because people just keep coming. He can't believe how many people that don't even know him keep coming. There's, there's, a, there's an encouragement in giving. And a lot of you know that. A lot of you are givers. A lot of you give even sacrificially. And the, it's amazing to me that uh, studies show that people who give, regardless of their income, regardless of their financial uh, state, the more that they give, the less they worry about money. Isn't that interesting? You think the people that had the best um, tabs on their money, the people that keep control of their money, would be the least stressed about money. But actually, the people that give the most are the less stressed with money. And you hear people all talk about all the time, successful people saying, you know, man, I never thought it'd be this much fun to give my wealth away, right? Just give it away. Because for so long, they've been trying to get it, and they were consumed with getting it and growing their company or whatever. And they realized, man, the, more, the fun is in giving it. And the reality is we could have done that a long time ago, right? We don't have to be billionaires to give. We can give any time. So um, he's a giver. That was, that's the first time we see uh, Barnabas as an encourager. But if that was where we stopped today, you'd say, you know what, that's great. That's a great, I can, uh, I get that. That makes sense. You know, be a giver. That's encouraging. I can be more giving. Uh, but that's not the end of the story. That is just the beginning of the story with Barnabas. So he gives and he helps this community in need. So in Acts 9, the story continues. And in Acts 9, it gets real interesting because there's this character named Saul. And some of you know that Saul was a persecutor of uh, Christians. And not just Christians, but anybody who opposed Jewish beliefs. Paul was a very smart guy. He was very, um, uh, very passionate about uh, his Judaism. And so he was going out, and he's basically like, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll clean house. Like, I'll round up anybody that doesn't agree with us. Um, and so that's what he's doing. But then he meets Jesus, right? He meets Jesus. He has an experience, and it changes him completely. And so he goes to Damascus, 
and he begins preaching. He begins telling people, listen, I, I messed up. Like, I had it all wrong. You don't understand. Like, I met Jesus, and this amazing thing happened, and you can know Jesus too. And, he's, and, he's, and people, the amazing thing is people are listening. People are responding. People are being converted. And this is all happening. And then the disciples, um, the disciples in Damascus, who aren't the disciples, but they're disciples of Jesus, you know, they tell him, you know, you, like, you got to go back to Jerusalem, man. That's where the real game is. That's where the, you know, the real disciples are. And, you know, you got to go ahead there. So he's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to do that. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go tell these guys I'm in, right? <laughs> Sounds like a good plan, right? But he's got a couple problems with this. And the first problem is that the Jews, the, 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 the Pharisees and the people that he was working for, didn't take too lightly to him going out and changing his tune and starting to preach the gospel. So they're after him. Let's look at Acts 9, 23. After many days had gone by, this is in Damascus, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan, and day and night they kept a close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. I'm sorry. Uh, day and night they kept a close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. All right, so that's his first problem, but that's not the problem I want to focus on. But I want to tell you that, that Paul can't go back. All right, he, he's burned that bridge. He can't go back to the Jews now after what he did, right? But he has another problem. Let's look at Acts 29, 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the, the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace, and it was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. So he gets to Jerusalem, and he tries to join these disciples. I mean, he's fired up, right? He's, he's just as zealous now about Christ as he was about eradicating the Christians. And so they don't, they don't buy it. Right? They're like, man, I don't, I don't buy this for a second. Like, this is the same guy that dragged our families out. This is the same guy that, you know, uh, killed our friend Stephen. Like, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't believe it for a second. I think he's just trying to get in and infiltrate us, you know, so he could take us out from the inside. I'm not buying it, right? But Barnabas believes in Saul. And I, I think more importantly, Barnabas believed that God could change Saul. Right? I, th I think sometimes we, we look at the person and go, I don't know, right? Because we're focused on the person. See, I know that person. I, you know, yeah, maybe they're doing good right now, but I, I know how they used to be. I don't know. What, what we forget to do is we look and say, God, yeah, that's nothing for God to change that life. Absolutely, he can be changed. She can be changed. You know, and we, we look past the person to what God can do, and that's what Barnabas did. I believe Barnabas, Barnabas looked past Saul and looked at what God did. He goes, yeah, but you know what? God did this, and I believe in God. Saul uh, vouched for, for, I'm sorry, Barnabas vouched for Saul. He didn't write him off. He, he didn't let Saul's past predict what his future was going to be. And he said, guys, we need to give this guy a chance because I've heard him talk, I've heard him preach, and that's of God. Like, I hear the Spirit. When I hear him preaching... That's of God, right? And he stands up for him. This is a fabulous gift. If you can be willing to take a risk on someone and see the best in someone, that's a gift. That's an amazing gift. And some of us don't realize we, we have it because we don't exercise it enough, right? It's too easy for us. And I got to tell you, there's people that I've, got, I've grown weary of praying for. I, I hate to confess that. But, you know, I, I just get tired because it's just not, I don't see it happening. And sometimes it's because I'm focused on the person and not, not God, right? In fact, I'm really giving up on God. I'm not giving up on that person. And I've got to confess that I've got to do a better job of seeing people's God potential 
and not giving up and, and keeping believing. So Barnabas had this gift. He had the gift that he could look at someone and see the best in them. He says, I can vouch for this man. He can be trusted. Um, and I remember um, I came to the Morningside in 2003 um, as a children's pastor. I had never uh, been a pastor before. I was a, a children's volunteer uh, for many years down south. And so um, I remember I had, my wife and I had served in fifth, sixth grade for a couple of years. And um, the coordinator at the time came to us and said, hey, you know what? We want you to um, coordinate the children's ministries. And uh, it was like a big, it was a big scary thing. I mean, it was like a church of 4,000. And it was like, it's a, bi- it's a big, kind of a big job, a big role. And they said, no, you know, you can do it. You're practically doing it already. Like, I, we think you can do it. And so uh, we did that for a couple of years. And then God start, really started working on me uh, to go into ministry. And so I did. I left my job and I went into ministry. And uh, the point of the story is that we were at a conference probably two or three years after I got to Morningside. And I'm at this children's ministries conference, and I've got about 10 volunteers with me. And I see this old children's director. Um, she wasn't old. I'm saying she used to be my children's director. <laughs> uh, and I see her coming down the hallway in, in Atlanta, Georgia at this conference. And I thought, wow, how cool. Like, Holly, there she is. Like, and so she sees me. I see her. We kind of, you know, run up to each other and, you know, and uh, give each other hugs and stuff. And I said, man, Holly, like, is God amazing or what? Like, this is crazy. Like, we were just Sunday school teachers, and now here I am with my own team, you know, and I'm a pastor. Isn't this crazy? Like, this, this blows my mind. Holly, this is so cool. And I'll never forget, she just looked at me, and she goes, we always knew. And she starts crying. And so I start crying, right? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, why do you think I resigned? Why do you think I stepped out of the way? She's like, we, we saw that in you. We saw that potential in you. And I got to tell you guys, that, that still gives me goosebumps. That still, and, and, I, and I always tried to take that to, to my team and to my people and say, you know, I believe in you because it's so powerful when you believe in somebody. And that, that she was a Barnabas in my life, right? And, and of course, the, the children's pastor had to okay that and everything. So there were a few Barnabas, Barnabases in their s- scheming behind the scenes. And, uh, and I can also tell you, when, when I took this job and left left that behind, they were cheering. They were, they were like, go get them, right? Go get them. It wasn't like, are you kidding me after all we put into you? Like, you know, you're going to leave us? No, it was like, no, go get them. Go get them. God's got somebody else for that. Go get them, right? When we believe in someone, it changes the course of history. Now, I don't know what God's got in store for me uh, in the future, but I know it's good, and I know it's going to be because someone takes a chance on me, right? And whatever God does in your life, it's going to be because someone gives you an opportunity. Somebody encourages you. Somebody spurs you on. Because the enemy is constantly attacking us. Constantly. And the moment you start to get traction, he is throwing sand in your path, and he is throwing stuff at you. And so, unless you have somebody that's going to get you going again, odds are you're probably not going to do a whole lot for the kingdom. Because we are under attack. And I think that's why God spends so much time uh, talking to us about encouraging each other. So let me get back on track. So Barnabas believes in Saul. He's willing to take a risk on Saul. And of course we know the rest of the story, right? Saul uh, Saul goes on to become uh, a major influence in the new church and in the new Christianity. So at the end of the passage, I love there's this, this great little conclusion. It says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Because that's what God does. When we, when we start believing in each other and encouraging each, uh, encouraging each other, um, the, there's peace, right? Because it's not complaining. And, and the Holy Spirit loves that atmosphere. He, said he wants to be part of that. You know, they were helping each other out. They were looking out for each other. They were encouraging each other. And the Holy Spirit was all over that. God blessed that early church, and it grew in numbers, um, not, not because of anything else, but because of the love that they had for each other. And God really uh, poured his blessing out on that. So, so here we are. He believes in Saul. Uh, Saul is accepted into the dis- group of the disciples. He goes on. He starts preaching. But after all this... Um, 
Barnabas has one more uh, major um, feather in his cap, and that is in Acts 11, verse 20 and 21. It says this, Some from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them, that, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now we have to stop for a second and just <laughs> recognize the enormity of this moment in history, right? This is huge. This is huge. From, from up until now, it's only been through the Jewish people that God's story's been told. Like, this is radical. The idea that, hey, you know what's good for us? Maybe it's good for these guys, right? And so they're preaching to these Gentiles, these non-Jews, to these people that know nothing about the Torah, they know nothing about uh, the history of the Jews. And they're going to the city north of Israel, north of Syria, called Antioch. And they're telling these people about Jesus. And so the, the disciples and the church and the, and the Jewish people in Jerusalem, they're so excited, right? They're so excited, like, yeah, go tell the Gentiles. No, no, you know, sometimes uh, religious communities are a little, a little scared of change, right? So they're like, hey, I don't know about this. This is taking like a different slant. Like if we let the Gentiles in, like what's that going to do to like everything that we protect? You know, this is, yeah, I don't know about this. I don't know about taking it out there. They might mess everything up. We've been protecting this really well for a long time. I don't know, right? And it all depends on who's going to make this call, right? So disciples get together and they go, you know what? Send Barnabas. <laughs> and thank God they send Barnabas, right? And Barnabas goes and he checks it out. And this is what he says in Acts 11, verse 23 and 24. He says, um, when he arrived and saw evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and he encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. So this city, this Antioch, is the first place that God opens the door to, to the Gentiles. And it's a huge hinge moment in the history of Christianity. Because Barnabas says, yeah, this is awesome. This is so cool. This is so great. You guys are doing amazing. Keep it up. Keep going, right? I don't see in here that he's like, you know, hey, you got this wrong and this wrong. He doesn't do that yet. There's a time for that, right? Like get, the, get, the, get the theology right eventually. But at the beginning, he's like, no, you guys are awesome. Like, this is great. Keep going. He's like, but we do need someone to kind of watch over this. We can't let it run too rampant. And he goes, man, if I only knew someone that could uh, speak to these Gentiles, if I only knew somebody, you know, that, that was sharp-minded, that was really a good debater, that he could really be convincing, really passionate, really, you know, who do I, ah, oh, yeah, Saul. Yeah, that guy, Saul. So the irony is that Saul, you know, he knew more about the Torah than anybody else practically, and he was devoted to it, he was so dedicated to it, and yet Barnabas says, you know what, I think he's the guy for this new group of people. And so this is where Paul gets his name changed. You know, a lot of people think, oh yeah, when he was converted, they changed it to Paul. No, that's not really how that happened. All right, he goes to the Gentiles, and it's, it's a very simple explanation. Uh, Saul was his Jewish name, and his, Paul was the Greek or the Gentile version. So he would become known as Paul, right? And you guys know, he would change the world. He, he would take the gospel out to the rest of of the world. And he did that because of Barnabas. He did that because of Barnabas. Barnabas was a huge part of his life, the entire ministry that Paul had. And in ancient times, um, in the ancient world, it was significant to see how they listed people in a story. Right? So if your name came first, you were the more important person in the story. And so, so throughout Acts, we see um, in Acts 11, we see, for a whole year, Barnabas and Paul taught great numbers of people because Barnabas was the leader. They sent their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Paul, it says in Acts 11. Acts 13, set apart for me, Barnabas and Paul, for the work that I have called them. But then something happens. Paul's gifts begin to flourish. He begins to have super success. He becomes renowned. He becomes known throughout um, all, this, all this region. And something happens in Acts 14. It says, at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas 
went to the synagogues. Did you catch that? Paul and Barnabas. And from now on, Paul would be listed first. Now, now humanly, we think, man, Barnabas, he messed up, dude. Like, that's, that's bad career management. Like, <laughs> like, you let him outshine you. This ministry flourished, and you let him get all the credit. How did you, how could you do that? Like, come on, pay attention. Like, you let him take the lead. But it wasn't about that with Barnabas. He didn't care. He wasn't trying to get famous. In fact, he was just trying to make God famous. And he didn't care who got the credit. And a real encourager, someone who really is a Barnabas, doesn't care who gets the credit. Right? I saw that with Holly when we saw each other in Atlanta. She didn't care. She was more than willing to give that position up. She went over to youth and started doing uh, youth. And she didn't care. So we just... She wanted to see someone elevated. She wanted to see the ministry grow. She didn't care who got the credit. It didn't matter to her. From a human perspective, we want to climb that ladder, right? We want to get that title. We want to get that, you know, that position. And that's not what it's about. Barnabas could have been jealous. He could have, he could have tried to tell everybody, yeah, but it was me. Don't forget, it was me, right? But he didn't do that. He was so happy for Paul. He was so excited for Paul. He never wanted to be famous. He didn't care who got the credit. And Jesus said that it was going to be that way in his kingdom. Did he? He goes, you want to be great? Be the least. If you, if, you want to, if you want to be known, serve. Right? His kingdom is upside down from our world. And Barnabas understood that. Barnabas is a kingdom kind of guy. He invested, other, he invested in others, and the world has never been the same because of it. Paul had gifts, Paul had talents, he had giftings that Barnabas didn't have. And he knew, like, this guy is the guy I need to make this happen. And good encouragers, people that are the best encouragers, they see something in someone else that they can pour gas onto that fire, right? And they can, they can say, I want to bring that part out of you. There's something great in you. Because there's something great in, in all of us. God has gifted all of us in different ways. And we just got to find out what that is in each other and, and, and help them, spur them on to uh, do everything that God wants them to do. Like I said, the, the New Testament is full of references to encouragement. Hebrews 3.13 says, Encourage one another daily so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. See, when we lack encouragement and we get down, sin starts to look good. Right? Right? When, when, we're, when we're discouraged, when we're down, when we're losing hope, that's when sin creeps in. And he says, encourage each other, because when you encourage each other, you won't be taken in by sin's de deceitfulness. Because you're not trying to fill some void. You're not trying to, you know, medicate yourself. <laughs> and, and Satan is always there with that, with that help, right? Here, I can help you with this. Here, try this. Um, Paul says... Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. Uh, let us not give up meeting together, as some of you are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And this isn't a humanism kind of thing. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not just saying, like, you know, we need to encourage each other, bring out the best in each other. No, I'm, I'm saying that we need to remind each other what God can do, not what we can do. You know, it's not, it's not about telling you that, you know, Aiden, you're such a talented musician, you know, keep it going, you're great. It's not about Aiden, it's about God, right? No, it's more like, Aiden, God has gifted you, brother, keep it up. Man, what you're doing, oh, man, is, is, is so inspiring, so encouraging, so uplifting. Keep doing that. God has given you a gift, right? The focus is on God. Barnabas wasn't focusing on Saul's gifts. He was spoken on what God did to him on that road. He said, wow, God did something to you for a reason. <laughs> He's got a plan for you. And, and how can I help you accomplish that plan? Did you ever think about what you want people to say at your funeral? <laughs> it's kind of a morbid thought, kind of a sharp turn there. But you ever thought about that? Because I, I think about this with, with, uh, with, with Barnabas, right? Barnabas wasn't really that famous. Like, he really didn't, he didn't write any books. There's no books in the Bible. Um, but, but he had a legacy, and he was, he was very kingdom-minded. So I imagine this funeral would be something like this, you know. Uh, this guy walks up to the front, and, and people are like, oh, dude, that's Paul. That's the Apostle Paul. He 
he's going to say something. Like, this is going to be good, right? And the Apostle Paul gets up there and goes, you know, uh, man, I had this, I used to persecute Jews. I used to be this, this, this rotten guy. I can't believe the stuff that I used to do um, in my zeal um, as, a, as a Jew and, and trying to eradicate this, this gospel, this new, this new uh, version of our faith. And, man, I used to terrorize people. Man, I used to drag them out of their homes, kids screaming. Like, I used to be this horrible guy. And then God changed me. And you know what? The people that I used to know didn't want anything to do with me. And the people that I wanted to, to minister with, they didn't want anything to do with me. And this, this guy here, Barnabas, took a chance on me. And he stood up for me. And he vied for me. And it changed my life. And, and, and he was always there for me. Right? And then this other person comes up from Antioch and says, you know, um, I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about the, I didn't know anything about Judaism. And this guy, this guy, Paul, he comes in and he teaches me and he tells me, you, you know what, you are worthy. It, it doesn't matter. I know they've been telling you that since you're not a Jew, you don't belong, but you do belong. God has, you know, Christ died for you. And he tells them the gospel. And I'm here today because of Paul. And Paul explained to me, what God can do with the life. And then another lady gets up, and, and nobody knows her. But she gets up, and she goes, you know what? I lost my husband. I didn't know how I was going to feed my children. I didn't know how I was going to make ends meet. And this guy, Barnabas, sold a field. And I got, I got some of that money, and it, and it got me by. And it got me back on my feet. That's the funeral of a kingdom-minded man, right? That's a guy who understood it's not about me. It's, it's about what I can do in other people's life. I can, I can lift uh, a, a terrorizer. I can lift him up and, and, and let him see what God can do with his life. Give him a chance. And I can, I can take this person who doesn't think they belong in this faith and show them where they belong in this faith. And I can help this woman who doesn't know how she's going to make ends meet and help her out. Be an encourager. Look for people who need encouragement. They're all around us, right? They're all around us. People that need to know that they can keep going, that they can make it another day. And not because of their strength. <laughs> not because of their strength. We don't have it. Sometimes, you know, when you're talking with people, you just got to say, yeah, you know what? You can't do it. You can't do it. It's, it's not possible for you to do it. But if you give it to God, he'll carry you through. And that's the image, right? God's from the, cheer, the sideline saying, hey, keep going. You can do it. And all you got to do is look over and say, hey, <laughs> come help. <laughs> come help because <laughs> I'm dying, right? Just, let me just put your arm around him and he'll carry you through it. You can't do it on your own sometimes. And, and, and when you're feeling that way, um, many of us uh, have come to Christ that way. We've come to grips with the fact that, you know what? I don't like the way this is going. I can't do this. I, I can't do this anymore. And you reach out, and God says, finally, <laughs> you ready to do this together? And there's people out in our lives every day, if we just look at those gauges, and we just look at those tanks, and, and, and not just go up and fill it for the, for the sake of filling it and making them feel better, right? But saying, you know what? I know something that can really help. Because I've been there. I've felt like where you're at. I've been where you're at. You know what's helped me? And, and tell them the truth about what helps us, what fills our tank. Right? And that's the gospel. Christ died while we were still sinners. That blows my mind. He died for us while we were still sinners. He died for us. Let's not give up on the fact that God can change anyone. God can turn anyone around. And I think Paul more than anybody knew that. And I think that's why there's so many references to encouragement in the New Testament. It's because Paul knew what encouragement could do in someone's life. It was all about that encouragement from one person. Barnabas changed the course of Christianity, really, by encouraging one person that God called to use. But I dread to think what would have happened if he hadn't had the chance and if he hadn't had someone that believed in him. And he let the naysayers hold him back. Be an encourager this week. Leave here determined to be a tank filler. And if your tank is low, 
there are people in this room that want to help. There are people in this room that want to, to guide you um, to the source of that strength. Um, I'll be up here after the service if you want to talk. Um, but let's, let's walk out of here this week determined to be a Barnabas, to find that person in our life that we know has potential. It may be seen, it may be unseen. But be determined to tap into that and help them succeed and help them grow as a person and see what God will do. You'll be amazed at what God can do when you encourage somebody. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for all that you've done in our lives. We ask that you help us to be more like Barnabas, Lord. Thank you for showing us that it's really not about us. It's about raising those up around us, Lord. Thank you for loving us enough to send your son Jesus to lay down his life for us. Man, for doing it while we're still sinners. We thank you that we can experience your forgiveness and your salvation that we can receive the gift of eternal life through your son, Jesus, Lord. We thank you for that. Forgive us, Lord, for not always seeing the potential in people. Forgive us for doubting that you could use us to do great things for you. Forgive us for doubting that people can change. Help us to remember that people are looking for hope and that the hope they need is in you. Help us to get outside our comfort zones and outside these walls where the people who need you most are found. Help us to be encouragers. Help us to be givers. Help us to be like Barnabas. And more importantly, help us to be more like Jesus, Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen.